Aaron Sparks here with Edge of the Web Radio. We're here at the Forbes Innovation Summit in Indianapolis, and I have with me Ting Guti, who is the Chief Investment Officer for the IEDC, which is the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Glad to be here. Hey, uh, we're a huge fan of the, of the IEDC, and what I would like you to do is, could you tell our listeners, encapsulate what your organization does for the state of Indiana? Yeah, absolutely. So we are uh, Elevate Ventures. We call ourselves a venture development organization. Uh, we are in that cro on that crossroad between the public sector and the private sector where we primarily serving public sector clients like the IEDC, helping them spur activities in the local entrepreneurship community mm -hmm. by actively investing in helping local startups to grow. So because of that, uh, our sources of funding is coming primarily from the state of Indiana, and uh, we do have an investment mandate in Indiana companies. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Now, this this engagement has happened only a few years now. Prior to that, there was some, I wouldn't say mishandling, that's not the point, but but they weren't really getting the grants and the money to, to the right organizations, and that's where you stepped in and and the entire corporation was founded to be able to be a sage guiding source for these type of investments. Absolutely, absolutely. So prior to Elevate, um, I was at the 21 fund under the IEDC. Mm -hmm. And uh, back then, as you pointed out, a lot of these uh, early stage technology financial support went to companies primarily doing the technology, technology development uh, efforts, mm -hmm. which is great. But we have found out is, you know, in the last, five to 10 years, a lot of these companies are not really progressing to the point of commercial, making true commercial impact, mm -hmm. even though the technology itself is awesome, it's nationally competitive. So we started thinking, what are some of the things, the pieces that are missing, some of the things that we can do to help them make that leap? That's when Elevate comes into play, where we have entrepreneurial residents that brings the business development expertise that helps them fundraise, and they really have enabled the technologists to do what they're good at, We'll repair them with entrepreneurs, seasoned entrepreneurs, to to really help make the business enterprise happen and grow. Absolutely, and that's the thing that that qualifier right there, seasoned, yep. because they've had failures, they've had successes, and you really can. I mean, this is more of the, the overall concept. You can't have a a state agency that's not ever been in these realms be able to effectively dispensate this type of funding because without any type of vetting system of, of uh, organizations such as yourself, there, there's no red flags that can ever come up that, they, that, they, that anybody would actually understand. You are right. So there's a, you just pointed, identified two issues. One, the state agency is tough to attract the top of talent that, that we are able to attract through right. the Entrepreneurial Residence Program. And secondly, and as a primary interfacing, Elevate as a primary interfacing entity was a private sector, you know, we project ourselves as a professionally run firm and fund. Mm -hmm. um, so that credibility with the private sector is important because we do have a co-investment mandate. A lot of times we're trying to co-invest with VC firms here uh, in the region or potentially even on the coast. Mm -hmm. So having that credibility as a, as a standalone versus being part of a you know, state entity makes a huge difference. Absolutely. You don't see this in many, uh, many states at all. I mean, yours is more of a I don't want to say pilot program because it's it's you have you have some water on the bridge. You're you're doing fantastic. Yeah, we we are the first one in Indiana. We popular. I mean, we're we're not the first one in the nation. Actually, we model ourselves after Jumpstart in Cleveland. They're uh, the nationally recognized model. We did do our homework prior to this. Sure. And we we recognize their model, their success factors. Uh, but we are the one who's populating the entrepreneur residence model in general here in Indiana. I mean, I say this. You know, three years ago, we don't hear about mm -mm. the buzzword about ecosystem, the buzzword about entrepreneurial residents, the help, the service, the mentoring. Nowadays, it's everywhere. I am aware of other organizations trying to do the same thing, which is great because we need more of it. Absolutely. I mean, that's just almost wise counsel for, yeah. for any public funds. Um, we're hearing two words in this summit, innovation and entrepreneurship. Can you characterize the distinction between those two? Let me give that a shot. I mean, I mean, I've been thinking about this. I mean, it's 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 mucky concept. It can be right. easily confused. In my mind, I mean, I look at innovation as a pursuit of new ideas, new methodologies, new business models that has the potential to either redefine an existing industry or potentially creating new ones. 
uh, versus entrepreneurship, uh, that's more a course of action of entrepreneurs, you know, try to seek out business opportunities, build and create profitable enterprises. Sometimes entrepreneurship, you know, but profitable business can be built through innovation. Right. A lot of times they're not. I mean, using the example, the exact target, 15, 20 years ago, we call it innovative, innovation-based companies. Mm -hmm. Today, there could be many profitable IT consulting business utilize the application or technology developed like the Salesforce exact target in the marketing automation space. And they serve you know, clients that can make a lot of money, and they, they, but we don't necessarily call it innovation. We don't look at it as innovation anymore. We, call, we, we look at it as entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that's, the, that's a, a very specific thing for entrepreneurs to understand is that just because you're an entrepreneur by name doesn't mean you are actually innovative. And I think the common ground here, all these different organizations that we're hearing is that there needs to be a, not a nucleus, but at least a branch of what you're trying to do dedicated to 10% dedicated to innovation and make a discipline inside of your organization. Otherwise, Somebody else is going to, if you, if you, if not now, they're going to be innovating right past you, and mm -hmm. you need to have that type of that type of uh, growth opportunity. Um, Absolutely, I think that Clay Christensen, the uh, the famous uh, Harvard professor who defined the innovation by his famous theory of uh, disruptive uh, innovators, exactly to your point, the basis of competition are constantly changing. The truly disruptive innovation are the one that change the basis of competition. And everybody so you're doing this, that. exactly. Absolutely. So if you don't, if you're standing still, you know, you're going to be crossed over. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you have exposure to many orga organizations that say they're innovative and entrepreneurial, right? What are some of the marks that you look for to validate those claims? Because that's your, that's your role with the state is actually looking at are they just entrepreneurs? And, and that's, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. But but your focus is to see whether they're innovative and if, if whether or not this gives back to the state. Correct? Right, right. So uh, like I mentioned before, when we look at specific industry opportunities, uh, we look at whether this something this is, has potential to disrupt an industry, mm -hmm. has the potential to put the, the change of basis of competition, enable the company to grow in a much faster rate than a typical 20 or 30 year trajectory. Um, so that's from the business and technology opportunity standpoint. From the people standpoint, really, we're looking at how the organization as a, as a whole, uh, are they allowing experiments to happen? Mm -hmm. Are they allowing mistakes to be made? And more importantly, are they adapt or are they able to quickly, quickly mm -hmm. learn from those mistakes and, and, and tweak their model and tweak their thinking and move on to the next thing? Because innovation is not, it's not standing still. We got to keep finding the little things and amplify the ones that work. Um, Mr. Nottingham, a speaker earlier today, and you're absolutely right. And he, he, he um, kind of epitomized that with the term relentless innovation. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely what yep. I'm saying. You just can't innovate a little and then say, all right, we're done. We're, we're good. You right. literally have to have that as that discipline. Um, as you evaluate different organizations in, in your role with Elevate, there's obviously companies that won't pass muster for that type of funding. What are your parting words of advice to organizations that aren't ready uh, to be able to cross that line or step up to that type of funding or that type of level of innovation? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Also a tough one <laughs> because let me give you a sense of scale. I mean, since Elevate was uh, the first launch in April 2011, we've seen over 1,100 opportunities. Oh. That's average about at least a one a day. Yeah. Uh, the, the good thing, the yeah. But the, but, but the good thing about you know us, you know, interacting people with us who do this on a daily basis, who do this professionally, is that we benefited from that vast experience. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to develop, and I think we did develop a knack for quickly dissecting opportunities and dissect, dissecting people, hmm. because it all comes down to no matter what technology it is, no matter what business you are in, it all comes down to people. Right. And the type of relationship that you're creating, not and you know, a lot of times with customers and with investors, is all the same thing. You have to sell them, not just on the solution, but more importantly, they have to believe in your ability to deliver whatever they need. For for customers, it's goods or services mm -hmm. to solve their issues. For investors, it's a growth and potential exit opportunity, profit opportunity. So you really are looking at the relationship that those principals have with all those different 
stakeholders. Yeah, and uh, we recognized our, but you know, we don't look at investment as one transaction. You do it, we move on. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship. A lot of times, this is five to ten years relationship. So we will look at the people, the entrepreneurs that, that have the same recognition. Mm -hmm. And um, and willing to see us as, see this as a partnership that we can build, you know, something together. We know there's going to be ups and downs. There's always going to be issues. That's that's the thing about entrepreneurship. There's always be problems, and you're not expecting. Right. Are you ready to handle those? And um, you know, I want to understand people change too. And I know so now a lot of times we said it's not personal. It is kind of personal in the well, sense I mean, that yeah. we have to believe in you. Right. We have to trust that we can work with you. But at the end of the day, I mean, personal, don't take it too personal because it's still business. We're in for the business. That's a tough separation for yeah. entrepreneurs. That, literally, that is, that's their baby. That's their dream. And to take those those points of constructive criticism. Right. But they have the opportunity to come back around. Absolutely. Right? We, we have absolutely, we have recognition to the fact that nothing is standing still. Everything is constantly evolving. Certainly. And we're certainly keeping an open mind and we hope the entrepreneurs will, will do the same. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank uh, you for the opportunity. You're more than welcome and we'll be watching Elevate in the future. In the future, uh, you, you certainly have a, a great involvement with a lot of organizations that that we're watching in inside of Indiana, so uh, we're we're keeping our eyes on you. Yeah, well, well, well. Keep in mind, we're a startup too. We're growing. <laughs> we're evolving. You know, if you have any advice or inputs, we're here. We're all yours. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So we love talking with our clients, and so part of what we enjoy doing is understanding what their needs are. And sometimes it really just comes together of things we're working on in the background and where they're wanting us to go. And I had that happen with VMS uh, locally here in Indianapolis, and we were talking with them, just things about the renewal and some of their concerns. And what was really cool was that they actually started giving me some negative feedback, if you will, with regard to portfolio. Not negative to the sense that they didn't like the tool or it didn't work, but they wanted more from it. And so it was really, really cool to be able to say, you know what guys, guess what? We're working on something. We'd love for you to be part of the beta uh, concept for this. It's called Heads Up. Your IT team is stretched thin. Heads Up makes work easier by providing the information you need about your cloud when you need it. Make faster, better decisions about your cloud with Heads Up emails. To set up Heads Up Alerts, first log into BlueLock Portfolio and create your custom notification rules around capacity, budget, and recovery. When one of your rules triggers a communication, you'll receive not only notification of the event, but also a research report that includes recommended remediation steps and suggestions to move forward. Heads Up is just one part of BlueLock's client self-service portal, BlueLock Portfolio. 
Portfolio provides clients direct access to manage and view their cloud behind the scenes. They can opt in to backups, view historical and projected spending, and view resources consumed across their cloud environment. Find out how BlueLock can help your team do more with less. Fill out the form on this page to learn more about BlueLock Portfolio and heads up.